Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Broadex. Our, our series on the research is happening here from our uh, faculty here at Broad College. My name is Sean Mulligan. I'm the Director of Development and Alumni Relations, and I'd like to introduce you our Dean, Dean Sanjay Gupta. Dean Gupta is the Eli and Edith L. Broad Dean of the, College of, uh, of the Eli Broad College of Business. And since 2015, he's led the Broad College to redefine itself through a comprehensive strategic plan aligning with the university's core values and guiding the college work, college's work to become a top of mind business school. He's an award-winning teacher and scholar whose research on corporate and individual tax policy issues have been published in leading tax and accounting journals and cited in media, court cases, and public policy forums. Dean Gupta has consulted for the big four public accounting firms, the U.S. government, and for Fortune 500 companies. He currently serves on advisory boards for several nonprofits as well. Dean Gupta is also a Spartan. He received his doctorate from MSU. He also received a Master of Accountancy from Bowling Green State University and a Bachelor of Laws from Calcutta University in India. He's a, uh, and he also received a Bachelor of Commerce from the University of Mumbai. So without further ado, please welcome Dean Sanjay Gupta. Thank you, Sean, and greetings everybody for joining us on this uh, next edition of Brodex. Uh, this is a forum that we uh, contemplated as a way of bringing the research of our top-notch scholars in the Broad College of Business at Michigan State University, uh, accessible, understandable, uh, in short ways. And so this is a takeoff on TEDx, uh, and I'm delighted that uh, today you will get a chance to hear from uh, three of my faculty colleagues who are experts in their own fields as they present short, thought-provoking and inspirational ways in which their research impacts business, the workplace, and our daily lives. We're going to begin with Dr. Brent Scott, uh, who is uh, going to talk about how do emotions affect us at work? How do we control them? Uh, traditionally, when you think about emotions, uh, they are viewed as having no place in business. However, emotions are a natural part of people's work lives. And Dr. Scott will discuss the benefits and detriments that emotions can have at work, as well as the predominant strategies that workers use to control their emotional displays. Uh, Brent is uh, the, Frederick, uh, the Fred Addy Distinguished Professor of Management at the Broad College of Business. He conducts research on the role of emotions at work, fairness, and the workplace and employee well-being. He obtained his PhD uh, from the University of Florida. Brent? Thank you, Sanjay. Um, happy to be here today and to talk to you about some of the, my own research on emotions as well as sort of the state of the science. And that word happiness, I think, is a nice segue into what I'll be discussing today. So let me share my screen, start the show. Well, I would say perhaps now more than ever, uh, it does seem like a good time to understand the consequences of emotions at work, as well as how to hopefully effectively regulate them. Uh, outrage is certainly prevalent, amplified by social media. Uh, we hear about and see frustrated and exhausted workers. And of course, there's continued anxiety over the current ongoing pandemic. Um, Although there have been a few bright spots here and there, uh, the New Yorker even recently proclaimed that Ted Lasso can't save us. So uh, now uh, I think it's a good time to be talking about emotions at work. And since they are sort of running high everywhere and I, I, I study emotions in the context of work, I wanted to share with you the state of the science on a couple of important questions, which are how do emotions affect us? And also what can we do to effectively regulate our emotions? As Sanjay just said, emotions were once thought to get in the way of business, but as it turns out, they have tremendous adaptational significance. And so let's start with a quiz on the effects that emotions have on decisions and behavior. So you, you couldn't get out of taking a quiz. So that's what I'm gonna start off with. Uh, so here are the following questions. And if you could read through those and choose which one you think is correct.
All right, Tammy, is everyone uh, seeing the results? Yes, we are. Yes. All right, thank you. All right, so we have uh, a, a variety of answers here. It looks like the majority said that uh, all are true, so 55%. So let's just say, let's just uh, take a look to see what the, the research says about each of these statements, starting with this first one about positive events occurring at work more often. So as it turns out, uh, positive events uh, do occur more often at work, about three to five times the rate of negative events, but there is this nasty prevalence for bad to be stronger than good. Uh, while positive events do occur more often at work, the impact of negative events on mood is about five times greater. And overall, there is a strong tendency for people to pay more attention and to recall negative events compared to positive events. Uh, this has adaptational significance. From an evolutionary psychology standpoint, it was adaptational to pay attention to the saber-toothed tiger that was about to attack. And so this is uh, one of the reasons why, why we do this and we have this natural uh, proclivity. I catch myself doing this on vacations with the kids. Most of the time we have a wonderful time, but when I think back about the vacation, there was that one time when my daughter threw a fit that just pops into my mind and I have to force myself to not think about it. Uh, but we do have this natural tendency. Um, and we also tend to pay attention to what's novel. And because negative events don't occur as often, we tend to pay more attention and uh, recall them. And so this one is uh, actually sort of false. Now this next one, do we stereotype more when we're experiencing negative emotion or positive emotions? Well, as it turns out, negative emotions signal threat and increase vigilant narrow processing. And in contrast, positive emotions signal that the environment is safe and lead to the use of more heuristics. Now heuristics would be things like the attractiveness of someone, their likability and such, and those are associated with stereotyping. And so as it turns out, we are more likely to stereotype when experiencing positive states than we are when we experience negative states. Now, not all negative emotions are created equal. Uh, as it turns out, anger operates similarly as happiness and other positive emotions uh, because it involves appraisals of certainty. So when we're certain about the environment, we use more heuristics. And when we use more heuristics, we tend to stereotype more. So we see this effect occurring primarily uh, for anger and happiness, whereas sadness uh, makes people less likely to stereotype. So this one's false. And finally, risk-taking. When people are feeling happy, are they happy-go-lucky? Do they throw good money after bad and take risks? Well, on the one hand, people experiencing positive affect do perceive a higher probability of success. So they think they'll win, uh, but because they wanna maintain their positive state, they view potential losses as especially bad. So as a result, the tendency is for people experiencing positive moods to be averse to taking risks. Now in contrast, people experiencing negative emotion tend to calculate that there's nothing to lose. After all, they're already in a bad state and they wanna do something to improve their circumstances. They also tend to act more impulsively and fail to self-regulate and so the net result of this is that they tend to take risks. Now, again, there are differences in negative emotion. Uh, here we see these effects occurring for anger and sadness, for example, but not anxiety. People who are highly anxious tend to avoid taking risks. And so it's specific to certain negative emotions. And so if you consider the implications for certain types of decisions, it's not simply the case that positive emotions are good and negative emotions are bad. Uh, it depends on the type of decision being made or the specific type of task. Uh, positive emotions are great for creativity. They lead to broadened and flexible thinkings. Uh, behaviors are effective too. Uh, if you're in a bad mood, then the research has shown that you tend to help more, not less, in an effort to boost your mood. And they can communicate things to others. So during negotiations, anger can be effective in extracting concessions from negotiation opponents. Disappointment, as it turns out, has the added bonus of signaling cooperation. And so it's even better than anger when it comes to negotiations. So again, it goes back to this notion of what Sanjay mentioned at the outset, which is emotions do have a place in business and both positive and negative can be uh, advantageous. And so this one turned out to be false as well. All right, turning to the second question, which is where I've done the bulk of, of my research here uh, at Broad, which is how can we effectively regulate our emotions? And so I'm going to put up another quiz and let's see how we do in this case.
Now everyone thinks I'm trying to trick them. So the question is, what do you say? Results are on the screen, Brent. Thank you. All right, so we see that uh, around 49%, uh, the majority, uh, or the, the one answer that was given the most often is that none of these statements are true. But there are some split uh, responses. All right, we hear in the popular press all the time that it, when it comes to controlling your emotions, that fake it till you make it is an effective strategy. Uh, however, and faking it in the emotion regulation literature is often referred to as surface acting, where you try to suppress an undesired emotion that you don't want to display, and you replace it by feigning the display of another emotion. As it turns out, this is a pretty bad strategy. Uh, it does a lot of harm to people. It uh, has these ironic effects. It's like, I tell you not to think about a pink elephant, you do it anyway. It's the same thing with trying to suppress, let's say a negative emotion, that the, uh, the, the actual feeling is intensified and people tend to feel more of it rather than less. And so faking actually does more harm than good. So that first statement um, uh, is true and so far that uh, faking is worse. Now, there is a caveat to this, and this is one study that we looked at, well, what if you fake negative emotion? And you might ask, well, where would you do that? Well, bill collectors might do it, drill sergeants, police officers, there are a variety of occupations where faking something like disappointment, anxiety, or anger could be advantageous. And it turns out that faking negative displays is actually good for you. And the reason for this is that you get to have your cake and eat it too. You achieve the desired display while still feeling good, or at least not so bad uh, on the inside. Now, finally, uh, the other funny thing about this is that even though faking tends to be bad for you in terms of emotions, if you do it a lot, you develop habits and routines. And so doing it consistently or on a routine basis is actually better for you than doing it some days and uh, not on other days. And so it turns out that if we go back uh, to these, uh, all of these are true. So you might ask, if I don't fake it, then what else can I do? Well, you can do something called deep acting, which is where you try to actually cultivate a desired emotion that you want to display. Now, you could do this by selecting a situation or trying to modify it in some way. But in many cases, employees don't have the luxury of doing that. And so we see two other strategies that they use that tend to be effective, one of which is to reappraise the situation. So, for example, a layoff might be reappraised as an opportunity to pursue one's lifelong dreams. Attentional deployment is something that can be done very easily in the moment where you try to focus uh, on a pleasant memory, such as a recent vacation, albeit the fit that your daughter might have thrown that uh, you try not to remember. But in any event, that turns out to be an effective strategy as well. Now, beyond these internal processes of surface acting and deep acting, one final thing that we see people doing is something called social comparison, making upward comparisons thinking about people who are better off than you. You might think that that would generate a negative emotion, and it can, like envy, but it could also be inspirational. And on the other hand, a downward comparison where envisioning yourself better off than others uh, can also lead to uh, positive emotion. It can induce uh, happiness. It can induce sympathy, compassion. Uh, as a drawback, it can also induce something called schadenfreude, which is pleasure at the misfortune of others, which you might have experienced when your favorite team beat a rival. So in any event, social comparison is also a, a pretty fundamental tool uh, for uh, eliciting desired emotions. And we have a recent study where ostracized workers are actually going to Facebook to make downward comparisons in an effort to make themselves feel better. And so ultimately, both positive and negative emotions have a place in business, and uh, we are not solely at their mercy. So the key is knowing when they're effective and also how to effectively regulate and control them. So I know that's a quick 10 minutes, um, and I'm happy to take any questions after this. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, Brent, we have one question in the, in the chat, and the question is, 
how do researchers or organizations usually measure emotions at the workplace? The, uh, the predominant way is just to simply ask people in the moment how they're feeling. Now, there is an issue with asking people to reflect over a long period of time. So a, a, a bad way of doing it is to say, how have you felt over the past month or year? That tends to capture more stable personality traits. We use what's referred to as experience sampling methodology, where we will survey people repeatedly over the course of the day to assess how they're feeling right now. Now, I'm also doing some work with uh, police officers, and they're wearing Fitbits, and that is actually tracking uh, some physiological uh, markers that we know correlate with uh, emotional states. So there are a variety of ways that, that people try to capture it in actual workplaces, but the person experiencing the emotion is in the best place to report on what it is that they're feeling. That's all, oh, here's, there's one, more, one other question in the chat now. Um, if you have a mental illness, what's the best way to maintain positive emotions in the workplace? Oh boy, uh, that is a, a, a tough question. Um, to maintain positive emotions. I would say that some of the uh, deep acting strategies that I've discussed have been shown to be beneficial, though they do require effort still. They're not without uh, the requirement of effort. I didn't touch on other things like social support, uh, but the use of resources and the environment can also provide a context that supports uh, the cultivation of, of positive emotions. And so that, that broader climate is also uh, something that plays a, a role in uh, certainly what we, uh, what we experience on, on a regular basis. A uh, good question. One last question um, from Beth. Why are you doing this research? <laughs> you study what you don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I started out in customer service jobs. And I found myself, I'm not a very emotional guy. I don't have a lot of highs and lows, but I found myself really struggling to meet the display requirements of those positions where I always felt like I was having to put on a happy face. And part of me just wanted to be my more authentic self. Uh, and so I, I really got curious about the demands that organizations place on, on workers with respect to emotions. You know, we, we joke about how emotions don't have a place in business, and yet organizations mandate certain displays uh, quite regularly. And again, it's not the case that it's always positive. We can think of occupations where negative displays uh, could be worthwhile or advantageous as well. And so I think for that reason, it was, uh, it was natural for me to, to be drawn to this particular literature, and try to understand it. Any other questions? That is the last, we, we do have a few other questions, but we're, we need to move on to our next presenter. So um, if there are questions in the chat, we will do our best to get them to the panelists for them to, to uh, answer to you if, uh, if, if at all possible. Sure, and happy to receive an email as well um, offline if uh, after the fact, if there's not enough time. But on that note, uh, thank you everyone. I uh, appreciate your time and attention. Thank you, Brent, uh, and uh, I'm delighted to introduce our uh, next speaker, my colleague from supply chain management, he's Dr. Jason Miller. And his uh, presentation is titled, Where Have All the Truck Drivers Gone? Uh, very, very much uh, in the news, uh, as you might have been able uh, to see from uh, the press coverage around this issue. Um, much has been uh, said about a shortage of truck drivers, but really state level employment data suggests the slow recovery of trucking employment is due to the slow recovery of manufacturing employment. That's what uh, Jason is going to speak to you about. Uh, he is an associate professor of supply chain management in the Broad College of Business, and he examines various topics in the for hire trucking sector, including safety, pricing dynamics, productivity, driver turnover, and employment. He holds a PhD in business with a major in logistics and a minor in quantitative psychology from the Ohio State University. Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that. 
I will share. Um, is everybody seeing a PowerPoint right now? You're good, Jason. Okay, we are good. So again, thank you everybody for attending. And as Sanjay mentioned, my title of my presentation today is Where Have All the Truck Drivers Gone? Now, as Sanjay mentioned, if you've seen media coverage recently, there's been a lot of discussion about a substantial driver shortage, be it the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, or CNN. Now, what's interesting is two years ago, I did a Brodex talk where I was talking about a similar topic. And in 2018, we were having the same conversation about, is there a truck driver shortage? Again, Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. But notice I said today in 2018. Why not 2019? Well, that's because between 2018 and 2019, truck transportation added 55,000 workers which is a substantial amount, so much so that the market turned and we went from a tight market to a loose market and actually many companies failed. And in 2019, interestingly enough, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the entity that oversees the employment data in the United States made a very public statement saying, there is not and has never been, I wanna emphasize that, has never been a serious shortage of people willing to work as truck drivers. So that poses an interesting question. Has COVID fundamentally altered something going on here? Or is it a much more complex story of what's going on today that's being picked up in the media coverage? Now, many of you are probably asking, why should I care? I'm a trucking guy. I get this question all the time. I'm in a very narrow space. I'm gonna give you three reasons why you should care. First off is every product that you are consuming today or is sitting in your office, at some point in time, it made a journey by truck. And so as a society, we have an absolutely vested interest, if there is truly an underlying shortage of truck drivers, to get this issue addressed because it does impact all of us. And especially point number two, it impacts our pocketbooks. So transportation costs for most companies is about four to 6% of their overall revenue, give or take. So, we're talking about inflation. The last consumer price index reading was up 6.2% year over year. Well, that looks very nice compared to the price increases shippers procuring full truckload general freight have been seeing, where prices are up on average 24.4% over where they were last year, which is an all time record. So you factor that in, you're looking at potentially another percentage point on overall inflation at the utmost. So it impacts all of our pocketbooks. And then it impacts you driving on the road because if there is a shortage or whether there is a shortage or not, entities have a incentive to get the laws changed and especially to change the laws such that 18 year olds who currently can drive intrastate class eight vehicles. So you could drive within Florida, but as an example, but the argument would be we should allow 18 year olds to drive interstate. So you're gonna have 18, 19 year old, predominantly men driving 80,000 pound equipment on US highways at 65 miles an hour. I'm sure that makes all of you feel very warm and fuzzy inside. So to inv investigate this question of have things really changed since COVID? What my colleagues and I did is we obtained state level data on truck transportation employment as well as the employment at the state level in industries that both generate trucking demand as well as essentially poach from the same driver labor force. Our data is monthly, it covers January 2017 through December of 2020. We have to get the data before the pandemic because there's a lot of seasonality to trucking employment that we need to remove. And when we take a look at the industries of interest for us, Apart from trucking, it's what we call the goods producing industries. Think essentially mining and manufacturing, which is still the source of over 60% of the demand for trucking. Warehousing to capture e-commerce activity, but also the poaching of potentially common labor pool. Wholesaling. Wholesalers rely very heavily on private fleets and they can poach drivers from for hire carriers. There's arguments that drivers also will migrate to residential building construction. So we could, we have data on that. And also parcel, which falls under courier and messenger employment. 
So we've got state level data on all of this, plus everybody's favorite topic for why are folks not working, state level maximum unemployment benefits. And so just to get a sense for what happened to overall trucking employment in the United States. In this graph, you can see the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What I wanna highlight is, is a plunge, about 80 to 90,000 jobs lost between March and April of 2020. And then we have what appears to be a fairly tepid rebound. This is what we're interested in, is what is going on in this time period right here at the state level. We have seen overall in 2021, pretty strong rebound, but that's gonna be out of the scope of this because we don't have the state level data yet. Now I wanna show you a plot just to kind of set the stage for how dramatically state level trucking employment was affected by the April, 2020 lockdowns. Michigan was actually the most affected state. Between April, 2020 relative to April of 2019, we lost 26% of all trucking transportation jobs. But we're not, and we are, a, we voted as a blue state. So is this a blue state phenomenon? Well, let's take a look. Sure, New York is a major loss because of the magnitude of the COVID impact. But take a look here, Indiana, Ohio, Wyoming, North Dakota, a lot of states are very impacted. You can see in this a very clear automotive manufacturing centric decline when you also factor in Alabama and South Carolina. That's sure painting a picture. It's more about the demand for truck service, truck transportation than the supply. If we take a look at December 2020 relative to December 2019, if you'll notice um, where we had seen the biggest change in goods producing industry employment, take a look at this. It's the states that seem to also have seen the biggest decline in trucking. Poses a really interesting question. Could this actually be much more about demand than supply? And so getting in very quickly to what our results are, and I'm not gonna go into the underlying statistics, but the most important thing to recognize is that what our models found is that the change in goods producing industry employment, so the decline in mining and manufacturing employment, was by far the biggest explanatory factor to understand state level changes in trucking employment. So the states that saw the biggest decline in goods producing industry employment saw sh sharper drops in April of 2020, and also a slower rebound of trucking employment by December of um, 2020 relative to that low point. And that's really being captured here in the scatter diagram is that manufacturing and mining demand that not recovering at the state level really pulled down the need for truck transportation. States that added more warehousing, rather than poaching from drivers, it actually increased the number of the rate of truck transportation employment recovery. There's no evidence that states that added more parcel jobs or more construction saw a slower rebound of truck employment. We did see the states that actually lost fewer wholesaling jobs saw a slower recovery of trucking employment. This is consistent with drivers transitioning from for hire fleets to private fleets that operate on much shorter distances, which keeps drivers less likely to catch COVID. And most importantly, no effect of state level unemployment benefits. The coefficient's actually the opposite of what we would expect. States with better unemployment benefits actually saw a more rapid recovery of trucking employment. So it's clearly not unemployment benefits keeping drivers on the sideline. So what is actually going on? So very quickly, three short explanations. First is if you look, 96% of trucking companies have six or fewer trucks. How most of those companies structure themselves is they attach themselves to manufacturers located in their local area. If those manufacturers aren't producing as much, then those trucking companies can't hire all of their drivers back. And so that lack of recovery in manufacturing and the slow recovery has been one of the biggest things that has reduced the demand or reduced the ability of trucking companies to bring back employees. Second, COVID-19 really upended the mixture of freight. And so the challenge is, is as carriers, you can't just magically add 15 or 20% of capacity, for example, from Los Angeles to Chicago, Illinois. You can't just do that because you have to be able to get your drivers back to Los Angeles and you don't want to run empty. 
And so freight networks, because of the underlying economics of trucking, aren't that easily adjusted to these massive demand shocks. And then third is unprecedented entrepreneurship taking place in trucking with the formation of new small carriers. And we can see this in two ways. On the left, you see data for new EIN number requests in transportation and warehouse. And this is mostly going to be picking up trucking. You can see since the pandemic hit, we've had record requests for EIN numbers. So we're seeing a lot of interest in people either becoming self-employed or starting new carriers. And we see over here from data from the quarterly census of employment and wages that the quarter with the most new trucking companies that ever went active was the first quarter of 2021. That's the last quarter we have data for. And you can see the average size of these establishments is plummeted. What that tells you is these are new, small firms that are entering. So record entrepreneurship. So what should you take away from this? And what do I want you to take away? For one, that recover, slow recovery of trucking employment was not due to supply side factors like unemployment benefits. It was due primarily to a lack of manufacturing output at the state level. That's why we didn't see truck transportation employment rebound more aggressively. Two, you have to factor in, we've upended the mixture of freight due to record consumer spending, but lower manufacturing output since before COVID. That is, makes it very difficult for carriers to adjust their networks of freight. And then three, we've had record entrepreneurship take place. That has pulled many individuals away from the mega publicly traded truckload carriers that happen to be the ones that talk the most about the driver shortage. And those drivers have either started their own companies and become self-employed, or they've banded together to form new small firms that have went active. So really a lot of this is a story about the, the creative disruption that COVID has um, generated. And with that, we should have some time for some questions. We will uh, we'll take your questions in the chat if you wanna uh, put one in there and I'll get it right off to Dr. Miller. Um, the question came up, where will the results be published? Uh, the target right now is my co-authors and I are working on a first off an industry white paper um, with Randall Riley. Um, they helped with the data collection. And then once the white paper is done, the academic article will be going to the Journal of Business Logistics. Uh, Jason, there's a question here. Um, do you expect that the industry will succeed in allowing um, younger drivers to drive interstate? I, I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think that there's too much uh, policy concern about putting 18-year-olds um, on interstate. And we're starting to see the market ease. Um, my hunch is that 2022, we actually may add too much capacity because that's what's tended to happen. Um, and so I, I, do, I don't think there'll be the motivation um, for that. Uh, <clears throat> Next question is, um, do you see improvements coming to the supply chain given the new companies that have, all the new companies that have formed? I, I do see that. I think a lot of them are trying to get down the, the learning curve right now. That's one reason that we've seen so much disruption. Um, I just co-authored an article in Journal of Commerce talking about this issue for warehousing and that warehousing jobs have been upended since the pandemic and trucking has shown the same exact pattern. Uh, the next question is, what, what about the impact to this industry um, is affecting it by the baby boomers aging? Uh, min minimal. That, the aging driver workforce is overstated when we look at the fact that there is an inflow of people. So that, that tends to be sort of an industry talking point, but it, it, again, it doesn't show up in, in the data that exists. So I'm not very concerned about that. Uh, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, the next one is, were there any regulatory changes that impacted trucking, trucking shortages? So in January of 2020, the drug and alcohol clearinghouse took effect, and that was much stricter about um, if drivers had um, tested positive for controlled substances, um, they, could, they had to go through a uh, rehabilitation program. But unfortunately, that you can't separate out the effects of that from when the pandemic hit. But again, I just tend to think that that is there wasn't a sharp drop in January of 2020 or February of 2020. So 
we should have seen that immediately and it didn't show up in the data. And last question, um, what about sales of new trucks? Did that show up in the data given the increase in entrepreneurship? So we've seen right now record, uh, the selling price for used trucks is at the highest it's been. Um, right now, the challenge is, is that manufacturing class eight vehicles have been at lower levels than we would like due to the semiconductor shortages. Um, so basically trucks are kind of, you know, there's very strong demand for new equipment. The challenge is right now is there's very long manufacturing lead time. <clears throat> Thank you, Jason. Um, we've got a number of other questions that are in the queue, but we're not going to have a chance to get to them. Um, would it be all right if uh, they, if people emailed you with a question in particular? Yep, absolutely. Please feel free to email me. I will, uh, I will share your email with them. Sanjay, back to you. Thank you, Jason. That was outstanding. And last but not the least, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Ayala Ruvio. The title of her talk is Not Politically Correct, Customer Political Partisanship and Customer Firm Relationships. Conventional wisdom has it that Democrats and Republicans are inherently different in their worldviews and often their behaviors. Yet, should we expect consumers with different political affiliations to exhibit different attitudes and behaviors towards the companies they purchase from? That's the area uh, that uh, Dr. Rubio is interested in examining and has been doing research in. She's an associate professor of marketing in the Broad College of Business and a very active researcher in the area of applied consumer behavior, focusing on issues such as identity and consumption, material versus experiential consumption, and consumer arrogance. She holds a PhD in entrepreneurship from the University of Haifa. Please welcome Dr. Ayala Rubio. Thank you so much, Sanjay, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, today, I'm going to share with you one of my latest research projects, but I would like to start with a somewhat um, non-politically correct question. So who do you think makes um, a more loyal customer, Republicans or Democrats, So, or both? So feel free to share your opinion, and in the meantime, I'll tell you, and you probably won't be uh, surprised to hear that our society has never been more politically polarized than before. Now, this is important because we know that our political views affect a wide range of behavior, uh, including our consumption behavior. So we know that, but what we don't know is how our um, political views affect the relationships that we form with our custom, our uh, companies, sorry. We have the results? So, okay. So there. So the majority of you uh, think that Republicans are more loyal and uh, followed by uh, some of you to think that both of them. Well, um, there are two theories. We'll get back to this in just one second. So there are two theories that can help us explain the effect of uh, partisanship on customer firm relationship. The first theory takes the view of ideological asymmetries, which is um, kind of reflect your answers, where individuals with different political view normally exhibit different um, behaviors. And you can see some of the initial um, findings that we have in the area of consumption behavior with regards to differences between liberals and conservatives. But um, the alternative uh, theory uh, coined the term the partisan mind. And according to this theory, uh, individuals that form very strong uh, affiliation with their political parties, regardless to what party it is, um, according to this theory should exhibit different behaviors and they will be um, uh, significantly different from those individuals that do not form such strong affiliation with their political uh, parties. So which of these theories is correct? Well, um, in order to answer this question, we use the SESI database, which is being collected by the University of 
Michigan regularly. We had a five-year data of over 16,000 customers from 110 um, large American firms. And in this database, uh, we had information about the political affiliations of this individual, as well as the strength of the affiliation. And you can see the scale that they use to measure it. And we also had information about their uh, level of satisfaction and the level of loyalty, which are indicators of customer firm relationship, um, range from one to 10, where 10 is very much satisfied, very much loyal. And this is what we found. So we see that um, strong partisan of both parties exhibit the highest level of satisfaction and loyalty in comparison to all other um, individuals. And this support the view or the theory of the parties in mind over the ideological asymmetries. But uh, we didn't stop here and we wanted to try and understand why. Why do we see this behavior? And our assumption was that affiliation with a political party and relationship with a company or a brand both address um, the same needs and motivation within the individual. And in this specific case, we focus on the notion of need for um, attachment and we hypothesize that those individuals that identify themselves as strong partisan will also report a high level of attachment to the companies that they're engaged with. Now, um, in order to answer this question, we collected data from 731 participants. Uh, we measured their political affiliation and strength in the same way that the SCSI data uh, base measure, measure it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, we presented them with six different fast food companies. Now, what is common to all those companies is the fact that they are politically neutral. And we asked them which of these companies they were engaged uh, with the most in the past year. Next, we measure the level of satisfaction and loyalty again in the same manner that the SCSI uh, measure it. And in addition, we ask them about the attachment to that company that they indicated. Uh, and again, 10 means um, very much attached. And this is what we found. Indeed, uh, strong partisans of both parties exhibit the strongest level of attachment compared to all other participants. We also, by the way, uh, replicated the SCSI results with, it, um, with regard to loyalty and satisfaction. So now you may say, but, but hold on, what happens if there's misalignment between the political view of the customer and the political view of the company, right? Um, what happens if I'm a Democrat, but the company I'm engaged with is Republican? Will I still show the same level of loyalty and satisfaction? Um, and that begs the question, and that's your second question, um, should companies to begin with, should they express their political affiliation? Um, Tammy, do you wanna pull that one out? It's up for questions. Okay, so should they express it? And there are initial indication that, ex company, that expressing political view by companies is a double-edged sword because uh, consumers that um, their political view are misaligned with the companies they're engaged with uh, might buy a cut the, the company and we have uh, data about it. On the other hand, um, consumers that their political view are aligned with the political view of the companies uh, will prefer those companies. Um, the results are shared. There. Yeah, I see that. Okay, so 64% of you says no. Uh, followed by a maybe. So let's try to answer this question. So to answer this question, we uh, randomly assigned those 731 participants to um, three conditions based on the following scenario. We told them that the company that they indicated before donate either to the Democrat party, condition one, Republican party, condition two, or we gave them no information 
about the political affiliation of the company. So that's the third condition. Then we asked them some irrelevant question about a loyalty reward program. But what we were really interested to know is right at the end of the survey, after they answer a bunch of other questions, we asked them to which party, the company that you indicated earlier, donate to, which is a recall question, simple recall questions. But what we found was just astonishing. So when we provide the participants with no information about the political affiliation of the company, look at this, 90% of the Democrat respondents in that condition indicated that the company donates to the Democrat party. And 70% of the Republican respondent said that the company donates to the Republican party. So what's going on here? Well, uh, basically we reflect our own political views on the companies that we do business um, we do business with. And that is our default assumption that um, both the companies and us share the same political views. But that's when we don't have information about the political affiliation of the company. What happens when we do have inf information about the political affiliation of the company? Well, this is where things get even more interesting because when we told the participant that the company donates to the Democrat party, almost all the Democrat participants in that condition answered this question right. But only 47% of the Republican respondents uh, answered this question right, which means that over 50% of the Republicans uh, in this condition said the company uh, donates to the Republican party, even though we told them that this is not the case. And the same happened with the Republican condition. 74% of the respondents says answered the, the, the question correctly, the company donates to the Republican party. But look at this, almost 70% of the Democrat respondents says that the company donates to the Democrat party even though we told them that this is not the case. So what's going on here? Well, um, apparently we have um, uh, confirmation bias. What does it mean? It means that when we encounter information that does not align with our worldviews, um, we just brush it off. So in this case, when um, consumers were told that the companies that they are engaged with uh, does not share their political views, they just brush it off. Because remember, the default is that we do share the same political view. But when that information was provided, well, consumers just turn on their selective um, hearing, which if you're married, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and just brush it off. So what's the answer to the question? And this, I'm going to focus on two uh, takeaways and start with the bottom line. Companies should absolutely express their political views if they have any. It costs them nothing. Those consumers that share the same views will probably favor them over other companies. But those consumers that their political views are not aligned with the company um, won't do anything. They're just going to brush that information off. So they the companies have everything to gain and nothing to lose. The other most important takeaway that I will leave you with is when, especially when we're talking about customer firm relationships, it's not which political party you're affiliated with that makes a difference. It's how strongly you're affiliated with your uh, political party that makes a difference. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and participation. And um, we'll move to Q&A. Feel free to put your questions in the chat or into the Q&A uh, portion of, of Zoom here, and we will get them on to Dr. Rubio. Well, I'm the last frontier between the presentation and lunch, so. <laughs> well, let me know if you have questions. You can always um, email me. Uh, you have my contact information. Reach out and uh, see if I can address any other questions. But listen. 
political views are becoming increasingly more important to our everyday lives and our effects go beyond just political behavior. Sanjay? Thank you, Ayala. That was uh, very stimulating. And uh, I hope uh, all of you who have joined us uh, today uh, found the presentations by uh, my colleagues, uh, Brent Scott, Jason Miller, and Ayala Rubio to be stimulating uh, and uh, thought provoking, uh, and hopefully uh, things that uh, you might uh, ponder about and perhaps even implement in your uh, work, uh, in your lives. Uh, and uh, feel free to reach out to us with uh, more questions that you have. Uh, once again, this Brodex is uh, our effort at bringing uh, our research that uh, oftentimes is uh, viewed as difficult to understand uh, or um, uh, hard to get at, uh, that hopefully we are able to break down those uh, barriers and be able to make it more accessible to everybody. Uh, we really uh, uh, appreciate your joining us today and look forward to continuing to stay in touch uh, uh, through these uh, webinars, uh, but also hopefully in person very soon with another edition of Broad X. Bye-bye.